It's always been fascinating to me how cultures create monsters. There's so much said about people by what they fear and how they express it. I think it's also particularly telling that American movies and fiction in general seem very interested in the concept of zombies. So I'm going to try and see why that is and what it says about us. Also, I read a bunch of stuff about this, and now I'm going to make a video, and you can't stop me. So, here we go. Let's start at the beginning. Zombies are the dead arisen. Not in the sense of Osiris or... How do you pronounce this? Jesus? Jeez? Oos? Je Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, not in the sense of Jesus, where resurrection is the result of divine intervention, and the uh, human spirit and personality come back in full form. No, zombies are merely the remnants of our mortal coil galvanized into motion by some magic or science. The way I see it, zombies are constructed publics. They're a way to paint a group of people or some aspect of our humanity with a broad brush to illuminate some unthinking swath of our culture, usually based around consumption. But I may be getting ahead of myself. Where did this staple of the horror genre originate? The word zombie has a few cognates to which its etymology can be traced, but it's most often linked to the religious practices and folklore of the Caribbean nation of Haiti. This is what we call Haitian voodoo. The first iteration of zombies are what we often call magic zombies, or voodoo zombies. Pop culture really seems to reduce everything it doesn't understand into its most sensational fragments. Haitian voodoo is no exception, and it's certainly not the heartless, spooky series of savage rituals it's sometimes portrayed as in media. You know, if you went to list the major religions of the world, you might list Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, but we've completely left out the religious identity of Sub-Saharan Africa in that list. Haitian voodoo is also not malcontent or primitive. The rituals themselves may seem foreign or even barbaric at first blush, but further intimation with their religious practices reveal them to be really a deep and tender expression of appreciation for their surroundings and fellow people. It's simply an amalgamation of the Yoruba religion of Western Africa and Catholicism. During the 18th century, the Yoruba were enslaved by French colonialists and shipped to plantations on the island of Hispaniola. The French tried to proselytize the slaves to Roman Catholicism, but the slaves continued to practice their religion in secret. Slaves found practicing their own religion would often be harshly punished or even killed, but some slaves escaped their oppressors, went off to the mountains, and formed colonies along the border of what is now the Dominican Republic. In the mountains, they were free to practice their own religion and became known as Maroons. It was these Maroons that inspired rebellion and caused the first slave uprisings, eventually coming to a head in the Bois Caiman. The Bois Caiman was a congregation of former slaves who all agreed to take an oath to kill their former oppressors. They were anointed with the blood of a slaughtered pig and set upon gaining their freedom through the Haitian Revolution in 1791, led by Toussaint Louverture. It was those Maroons that eventually became known as the Bazanga, a secret society of voodoo practicing peacekeepers to some, night-wandering cannibal criminals to others. It is important to the Bazango and voodoo practitioners in general that nobody is killed. This causes an ethical dilemma. Bazango, like all people, acknowledge that some crimes are beyond redemption and that there needs to be an ultimate punishment. Without there being any legitimate justification for murder in their society, zombification is sometimes seen as an unfortunate necessity. I really am sorry about that pronunciation. The process of zombification to a bakor, which is like a Haitian voodoo sorcerer, tend to vary based on the practitioner, but it generally involves the creation of a coup de poudre. Sorry about my pronunciation. Or powder strike. This is concocted from personal items of the future zombie, human and animal remains, and mystical herbs. The mixture is either drank, injected, or administered through blow dart. The effect of this mixture is paralysis and a slowing of the heartbeat, giving the appearance of death, but the person is still aware of their surroundings. Bodies in Haiti are buried quickly to avoid the heat and humidity which sets corpses to rot almost immediately. The body is exhumed by the Bacor before they suffocate in their grave, and then an ancient rite is performed over them to capture their spirit, or tibon -am. Again, I'm sorry about pronunciation, but I'm not Haitian. I'm trying, I don't speak Creole. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. This rite separates the spirit of the victim into two complementary types of zombie. The spirit zombie of the Tiponang alone, and the zombie cadaver, the zombie of the flesh. Then he traps the spirit zombie part of his soul into a container of some kind, and replaces it with the loa, which is like an intermediary between them and the creator god, Bondye. Then the container is wrapped in something owned by the victim, usually a piece of cloth 
and then it is hidden in a place only known to the Bacor. A day or two later, the Bacor administers something called the Zombie's Cucumber. I promise I'm not fucking with you. Only this time, the effect is to reawaken the victim and place them in a state of heightened suggestibility and confusion. Under the thrall of this powder, the zombie has no memory, no ability to speak, and no personality. In this state, the zombie is conscripted into labor in the fields or for construction. They are completely under the rule of that Bacor until that Bacor dies, and then they trudge back to their grave for the long nap. In Haitian folklore, zombies aren't necessarily seen as dangerous unless they're given salt. The taste of salt supposedly reminds them of their life as a living person, and causes them to either kill the Bacor that created them, or shuffle back to their grave. If it is truly a manifest phenomenon, I imagine it's a lot like hypnosis, where only people who believe in the process can be affected beyond the purely physical influences of the concoctions and rites. I imagine the victim rebuilds their identity as a zombie as the result of being buried alive, and the hallucinatory effects of the drugs, mixed with the societal implications and reinforcement in the existence of zombies. The poison I mentioned earlier has a curious secretive origin to it. The many groups of scientists, chemists, and ethnobotanists have taken it upon themselves to uncover the truth about the coup de poudre, the Bazongo remain tight-lipped about it. They only seldom reveal the contents of the mixture to well-meaning outsiders. Through various interviews and other investigatory means, the active ingredient is most often found to be tetrodotoxin, among other natural poisons from the local flora and fauna of the Fertile Island. It's unclear how Haiti as a whole feels about voodoo. It has melded so much with the concepts and aesthetic of Catholicism that the lines are blurred. Some Haitian Catholics condemn it as sacrilege, but the lines are not so clearly drawn. From what I've seen from a few dozen interviews, you ask two Haitian people how they feel about voodoo and you get three answers. Why is American pop culture so obsessed with zombies in particular? There are many religious rituals that are foreign enough to the waspy, pearl-clutching, intellectual toddlers that compose 20th century American sensibilities. So why the focus on zombies? Whoa, what? Haiti wasn't a German colony before achieving its independence? What the hell are the Germans doing here? I know it's crazy to think about Germans being involved in turn-of-the-century global destabilizing politics, but buckle up, things are gonna get kind of hilarious for a second. To set the stage here, we have to talk about the uh, Looters Affair. The Looters Affair was a uh, embarrassing kerfuffle, I guess, that happened in Haiti in 1897. On September 21st of that year, Haitian police were looking for somebody who was accused of theft named Orleas Presume. They found him washing a coach outside the central stables in Port-au-Prince, whose proprietor was Emile Looters. Presume resisted arrest, and Looters, who had heard the noise outside, uh, came to his employee's defense, I assume shouting, Fuck 12. Both Presume and Looters were sentenced by the police tribunal to one month in prison for assault and battery. But get this, they appealed to the correctional tribunal, and instead of getting a reduced sentence, they actually added a charge of using force to resist arrest. This time the squeaky wheel just got straight up taken off the cart. The original sentence was annulled, and on October 14th, they were sentenced to one full year in prison. This wasn't Looter's first run-in with the law, either. He had previously been sentenced to six days in jail in 1894 for battery on a soldier. Bit of a teutonic recidivist, this guy. Witnesses for Deleus and Looter's uh, attack on this officer weren't in short supply, either. There were British, French, German, and even local witnesses. You could have heard this guy was guilty in four different languages. Nonetheless, on October 17th, the German charge d'affaire, Count Schwerin, demanded for the immediate release of Looter's, who had been born in Haiti but had a German father, as well as the removal of the judges and the dismissal of the police officers involved with the case. I mean, yeah, a cab, but this is ridiculous. Responding to intervention by the American representative W.F. Powell, President Sam of Haiti uh, gave looters a full pardon and he left the country on October 22nd. On December 6, 1897, two German warships, the screw corvettes SMS Charlotte and SMS Stein, anchored in Port-au-Prince without saluting. Captain Thiele of the Charlotte sent word to the Haitian government of an ultimatum. The conditions were deliberately humiliating. They wanted $20,000 for looters, assurance that he could return to Haiti, I guess to fight more cops, a 21-gun salute to the German flag, a formal letter of apology to the Germans, and a reception for the German charge d'affaires. Oh, and they had four hours to decide. Oh, 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 and they also had to raise a white flag as an act of contrition at the presidential palace. Yikes. Now, despite the Haitian people really just wanting to scrap these Germans and be done with it, the Haitian government folded, and they raised the white flag, and uh, nobody was really 
given any solace by the fact that it was just a parliamentary standard as opposed to a typical white surrender flag. Still, I mean, the function is the same, right? They, they folded, they, they surrendered. This did not go over great. Solon Menos, foreign minister of Haiti at the time, actually fought a duel with a member of Luder's family. This led to an action for defamation by two German officials requiring him to append a statement in his book about the Germans' butthurt in the Luders' affair. The Luders' affair was extremely embarrassing for President Sam. It made him look like a punk bitch who wasn't willing to stand up for Haiti's honor, and may have led to his resignation in 1902. Germans living in Haiti at the time held a disproportionate amount of wealth, and some of them used that wealth to form militias to try and seize control of the nation. Oh look, a power vacuum in a former European colonial territory trying to take control over its vast natural resources of sugar and coffee. I wonder who would be interested in that. America, fuck yeah. Holding true to the proud tradition of exploiting conflicts in the Western Hemisphere for political and economic gain, America took its chance to occupy Haiti from 1915 to 1933, probably largely just to protect industrial exploits like the Haitian American Sugar Company and to distribute freedom from the ends of their guns. We're not going to go too deep into that, but if you need a visual, just imagine Uncle Sam rolling the Monroe Doctrine up into a spliff and blowing the smoke into some poor schmuck's face who's working for 40 cents a day at Hasco. Anyway, this is when tales of Haitian voodoo and zombies started to circle back to the United States. Now, it should be no surprise to anyone that 20th century American sensibilities were at best, uh, fascinated with the perceived eccentricities of the Haitian voodoo religion. And at worst, they saw it as barbaric evidence for white supremacy. This is evident in The Magic Island by William Seabrook, 1929, one of the first and most popular accounts of zombies to make it back to the States. Now Seabrook, despite being led by curiosity and appearing to treat his Haitian guide and Haitian people in general with a modicum of respect, he tends to like white explain reality to his guide when they're out in the sugarcane fields looking for evidence of zombies. They do end up finding a group of workers that the guide refers to as zombie laborers. But uh, Seabrook writes them off as being lobotomized or neuroatypical. Of course, his language on the subject reflects the insensitivity of the time period. I had seen enough. Naturally, the zombies were nothing but poor, ordinary, demented human beings. Idiots. Forced to toil in the fields. The book was a hit and inspired many future creative works, even in the world of film. This may come as a bit of a surprise, but early Hollywood accounts of zombies held relatively true to the accounts they were based on. Of course, there was some drift through interpretation, mostly because foreign customs pass through the sieve of analysis and explication as they move through different cultures. This process resembles the telephone game, even in the era of the internet. But White Zombie somehow represented its source material, at least. Unfortunately, the source material mentioned is the uh, Magic Island that we've already talked about a little bit. The plot completely whitewashes the particularities of Haitian voodoo out of the story, and only holds on to the concept and process of zombification as inspiration. Essentially, it's the tale of a man who seeks the love of a woman, who has spurned him and sought the affection of another lover. Instead of dealing with this like a person who cared about her happiness and well-being, he devises a plot with the hilariously named Murder Legender, <laughs> played by Bella Lugosi, who operates a sugar plantation entirely operated by zombie laborers. Their plan is to kill her and bring her back as a zombie, where she will be under his thrall and love him, I guess? This does not work out, and uh, the plot culminates with the murder being, um, murdered, and the uh, female lead just sort of gets over being dead, and uh, ends up with the the uh, guy she wanted to be with, so happy ending. Now, if you're paying attention, we're starting to see how zombies are used as a narrative device. In White Zombie, they represent the extended will of a power-mad villain, and how exercising that authority over other people can eventually lead to the person executing that power's downfall, both in an emotionally abusive sense and in the sense of labor exploitation. Now we have this mechanism, this mindless shell, where humanity in its entirety can't exist, but certain compulsions still remain. This concept of zombification evolved through time, eventually touching on themes of consumption and violence. And that leads us to... I know you were just salivating, slumping forward with outstretched arms like a mindless automaton waiting for me to bring this guy up. Let's talk for a bit about George Romero's Night of the Living Dead and his concept of zombies. Spoilers ahead, I guess? 
By this time, the exegesis of zombies has been pretty well divorced from any Haitian tradition. Many movies, pulp comics, and other media had familiarized American understanding with the concept of zombies so that they could complete the process of removing the historical material significance of the cultural traditions and replace it with a consumer product. Also, Jim Crow America just really liked to steal things from black people. Perhaps more than anyone, Romero uses the concept of zombies to elicit fear and unconscious avarice and subhumanity, but now he's doing it by comparison. What I mean by that is that zombies and their controllers are now not the sum total of what's to be feared in the narrative. In the film, the main character Ben, played by Dwayne Jones, does not fall to zombies. Instead, he's taken down by gun-toting rednecks who are just taking advantage of the situation. The horror does not purely lie in the unexplained or supernatural. Now questions of personhood and culture are raised. Zombies can even be seen as a metric by which the caring, considerate, thoughtful aspects of humanity are juxtaposed. Zombies, as Romero paints them, are not driven by the will of some mad villain, but by the corruption of radiation, leaving them with only the desire to feed, uninterrupted by any acknowledgement of their surroundings or any consideration for community or governance. This seems to parallel the excess of American society in a post-nuclear, post-World War II context. The audience is left to examine their own desires and motivations on this criterion. They may ask themselves, to what degree am I led by the desire to satisfy my own baser urges? What would I be leaving behind by thoughtlessly stepping in line with a society that worships nothing but satisfaction and pleasure? This line of thinking is fleshed out further in his later film, Dawn of the Dead. Even the setting elucidates the conflict between humanity and a culture of crass consumerism, and how they are struggling to cooperate in that context. The events mostly take place in a Reagan-era shopping mall, where all things go to die. However, now the cause of the outbreak is seen as disease, a viral spreading of the need to consume humanity through mastication. And those who resist the undead horde are forced to eke out a place for themselves among the halls of capital consumption, hiding from the droves of the deathless without recourse for survival in the open world. Even if they had stayed in the countryside, the legion of consumption would eventually claw its way to their doorstep in search of the humanity it must devour and convert into extensions of the ever-gnashing maw. I know I'm not really breaking new ground here. Consumerism bad isn't exactly a new idea. I guess I just wanted to impart the clarity I can see in the distinctions that separate zombies from humanity. I think it's always worth examining our past and learning from the stories we tell ourselves to try and keep us on track. Whether or not we listen is another issue. Uh, thanks for watching, and if you made it all the way to the end, I sincerely appreciate you. If you want more videos like this, go to patreon.com slash andycarnival and subscribe to the Gumball Gang. You get videos in advance, access to exclusive content. It's really sick. You can also go to twitch.tv slash andycarnival and see streams. Uh, we do poll casts every once in a while. Uh, you can go on Spotify and listen to the Phantom Nonsense podcast. Uh, basically, you know, like and subscribe, Indie Carnival. Get some. Get some.